Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Roxanne George. Uh, Dr. George is a board-certified uh, pediatrician uh, with special interest in training and moving toward a lot of uh, interest in lifestyle medicine. She's a member of the Abacare uh, Sussex Pediatric Group, and uh, she uh, does a lot of work with really turning families and children on to this way of living and eating. And we want to really get some a nice conversation going about her history and her, 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 her work. So welcome, Dr. George. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate it. You know, when I was going over your bio, I noticed that as early as college, you had gotten interested in uh, doing research that you were doing in epigenetics and cystic fibrosis and things of that kind. And it kind of triggered your interest to go in the direction of medicine. Well, let's back up before that. Where did your interest in you know a more of a plant-based lifestyle or did it happen later in life or was that um, it's actually something i found out later in life as far as uh the plant-based side of it i um started it started more so when i moved to houston um into you know after i finished uh got into my medical career i guess you could say so um houston you know sort of opened up uh, a whole other side of nu nutritional issues. When I moved down there, I really, you know, was it was apparent the childhood obesity epidemic, um, and I didn't know that when I moved down there that Houston is known for their obesity rates. Um, so it was when I moved down there that it sort of was like, what is happening with our nutritional education and pediatrics? I feel like messaging is not landing, and so that's when the plant-based side of it um, sort of revealed itself. So that's um, when you had gone down to Texas, is that what you're saying, down there? Yeah, I just moved down there for other reasons, but yeah, when I got there, I just sort of realized there was, you know, a big issue here, and being sort of a researcher at heart, like you mentioned, I had done a lot of research in like cystic fibrosis, antibiotic resistance research, viral research. So I'm a researcher at heart. I went into medicine because I like the hands-on side of it, kind of bringing the research into practice, or I felt like I could do more that way. And I like to talk, so it kind of <laughs> lends itself to that. And so well, that's- I, I lived in Texas for a while. I did research down in San, in San Antonio myself. Were you dealing with uh, a part of the indigenous Mexican community? Is that part of what that was down there for you? Or was that really just the Texas just community? Just the Houston you know, community, okay. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you were, you were confronted with this issue of childhood obesity and some of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So w when you did that, I understand you got confronted with that. But mm -hmm. what were the influences in the aha moments for you that said, you know what, I need to go in this lifestyle medicine direction? What, what was the triggers for that? What were the things that provoked that in your life? Um, the thing that triggered it was when I went into the research and started finding things about dairy not being um, as healthy as, you know, we were made to sort of educate our patients on, you know, pretty much at every visit through the pediatric life, I was, you know, trained to always ask, you know, how many servings of dairy are you getting so that we know you're getting an adequate calcium intake. And when I started reading research about dairy not being you know, causing, you know, being a risk for cancer and diabetes and having, you know, one of the main sources of saturated fat and cheese. And so it was sort of an aha moment for me being like, what am I, what am I telling these kids and families to have if that they don't actually need this? And it's not, you know, that it's neutral, it's actually harmful to their health. That was my aha moment. Uh, moment. And then I started delving more into the research of fiber and the, you know what we knew then we know more now but uh, what we knew then about the gut biome and fiber and all of that 
Well, how was that translating into your life? I understand that you were observing that in your patients and research. So when did you make the step and say, you know, this is something I need to do for me too? How did that, how did that come to pass? It all, it all happened, you know, relatively quickly considering, because when I started doing that research about what it was happening in pediatrics, I started just reading all about how meat and all that is detrimental to health that I, you know, after reading, not even finishing, but going through the China study and reading some of the other books like Dr. Esselstyn and, you know, all the big, you know, right. fathers of nutritional uh, plant-based medicine, um, you know, just reading a little bit into their research. I, I personally went cold turkey. I don't recommend it, um, but sort of my mind sweat mindset shifted completely and I went uh, completely plant-based because I, you know, once you get that mindset change, I like couldn't even put meat in my mouth. And this is from somebody who was, you know, you say omnivore, but I was actually a carnivore. <laughs> I was doing well, you know, in those early things. in those early days and that earlier part of your practice time, um, when you have that major transformation like that, and it's, you know, a real revelation for you, and you realize the impact that it could have on families and the patients you were working with, and you were dealing with a very conventional population. So talk to me about the obstacles and the dilemma of now trying to bring that into the lives of these people who certainly did not have the orientation to its benefits, who were living in a really different way. Talk about what those obstacles were for you as a medical physician in dealing with that population. Yeah, I mean, you say were, but the obstacles are still there. Um, the <laughs> obstacles are <laughs> um, the social, you know, everyone is eating this way. There's sort of a, uh, I don't want to say negative, but there's sort of a different connotation to not eating meat, especially, you know, especially in Texas, especially in the South. Um, but in general, where, you know, protein is king kind of mentality that, you know, we have in the Western world is, you know, the first question out of, of course, everyone's mouth is, what would I do for protein? And um, I think that is a, a huge hurdle. And the fact that our children and families sort of eat a very, um, what we say is like a taste, like sort of a flavor saturated diet, you know, they're concentrated sugars and salts and fats, where even when you get them to try something that doesn't have that level, I say like on a scale of zero to 10, a level 10 of salt or fat, that it tastes like cardboard to them. And I always try to preface it with, look, you're going to have to eat healthy for a while until you can actually taste the sweetness of broccoli and kale, you know, but, you know, I think that, oh, they tried it for two days, they won't eat it, doctor, like, forget it. And my husband, you know, thinks I'm crazy for even trying this. So it's not going to work. I mean, those are the constant <laughs> obstacles. Um, so I take on a sort of a, a messaging of don't try to talk to them about what you're taking away as much as what we're going to add in. You know, um, you can still, you know, you want to have your cereal with milk. Let's start by adding blueberries and then let's maybe switch out the milk, you know, cow's milk for oat milk and, you know, start making sort of stepwise changes that we can build on. And I think that is, um, you know, the most successful way. Um, I'm in pediatrics, so, you know, in most cases, I'm not reversing something like a heart attack and, you know, some of the older, you know, internal medicine doctors and cardiologists. For me, I always have to talk to parents about, look, you're doing this now and the child's tolerating it now, but at 25 years old, we don't want him or her to have diabetes, right? So let's think of how this is gonna impact them later on. And unfortunately, it's really not even taking that long. You know, we're having our 18, right. 19 year olds with, you know, signs of fatty liver disease and diabetes. And yeah, let, let's hold let's hold that thought. I want to take a short break and hear from our sponsor. And then I want to come back and get into that discussion because that's a big one for me, too. And I want to really kind of get involved with that with you. I'm here with Dr. Roxanne George, board certified pediatrician. We're talking about the plant based lifestyle. And we're going to take a few moments just to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. And we'll be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Dr. Frank Sabatino here, encouraging you to check out the NHA membership. For just $35 a year in the US and $55 internationally, you'll have access to a wealth of resources, including our quarterly full color print magazine, Health Science. Stay updated on the latest health tools, inspiring stories, 
and exclusive events like the NHA conference and plant exclusive cruises. Join us at healthscience.org forward slash membership and make a difference in your life and the world. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host, and now back to the NHA Health Science Podcast, where more exciting insights await you. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with Dr. Roxanne George, a pediatrician. And we were just starting to get into this remarkable, kind of devastating transformation of the culture where we're seeing chronic diseases that normally would manifest significantly later in the population showing up younger and younger. And I know that's got to be that's got to be a real interesting conundrum for you and a real devastating thing to observe. So let's talk about that. I know on your website, you talked about the fact that you've got children that are already showing fatty streaks in the blood vessel walls in the endothelium by the age of 10. So we're seeing the forerunners of, of heart disease that early. We know that one of the biggest populations now of people developing type two diabetes, which is typically an older person diabetes are people between the ages of 18 and 30. So we're planting the seeds for these devastating consequences. Talk a little bit about that and how that impacts how you do your counseling and your work in your own personal practice. Um, you know, at first it sort of, you know, lit the I guess fire under me to get this messaging out, just, you know, coming across those studies showing about, you know, if you're eating the standard American diet and you're 10 years old, you already have these fatty streaks. I mean, it's not like let's wait for your first heart disease related issue or symptom before we start this, because, you know, it's not happening in one or two years. It's happening through this lifetime of eating this way. And I think people maybe are starting to sort of see that or understand that, but they really don't think about it at the pediatric level. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons they had to change the wording on um, diabetes from being type one and, you know, it, it's now type one and type two, it used to be juvenile onset and adult onset is because right. unfortunately it's not so adult onset anymore, you know? Um, so it's type one and type two, and there's two totally different reasons you get both of those. And, you know, the type two is the one where, you know, you are developing all these, you know, issues of being able to process um, glucose and st store glycogen and all of that, because, you know, you've had this diet of eating so much saturated fat. Um, and, you know, lack of vegetables, lack of fiber, and your body has to sort of put that fat somewhere and, you know, kind of shoves it into all these transporters that unfortunately impedes our ability to store glucose and, you know, raises our blood sugar levels. So um, in my practice, you know, again, it's, you don't have sort of like, you know, an hour to kind of give a dissertation to each patient, but you have to kind of get to the nuts and bolts of it where, you know, we have to add more fiber and more vegetables and more fruit, eat your fruit, don't drink your fruit, you know, you know, stay away from all these high sugar foods and, you know, stay away from the number one killer, which is saturated fat. People, I think is, it's interesting, they don't really know where saturated fat comes from or cholesterol um, or, you know, why necessarily, one, you know, thinking of it in a spectrum I found has been challenging and they just want to know what's good and what's bad. And this is black and that's white. And so sort of changing that mindset too, like, yes, you know, whole wheat is maybe a smidge better than whole, you know, white bread, but, you know, whole grain or sprouted Ezekiel bread is way better or just eating the oatmeal and the millet and, you know, is even better than that, you know? So thinking of it sort of in this spectrum, um, you know, has been, I think uh, the best way to, you know, try to starting to educate them of how foods are not like awful and not amazing. You know, there's, there's sort of a spectrum and you can sort of gradually get your way to the better side of things, um, I think has been the way I've been approaching it. And like I mentioned before, just sort of crowding out the plate with healthier options. So um, giving them a real life instance, like, okay, you're looking at your plate, you know, and draw a line down the middle for my adolescence. I'll be like, draw a line down the middle. Half that plate is what you always had for dinner. And the other half is all any type of vegetable you want cooked however you want. It just has to be vegetables. Um, 
pick your favorite vegetable, try to do a new vegetable every week or every month, something you've never tried before. So keep it interesting. There's like 300 some thousand vegetables out there. You can try a new one and not get bored. Um, you know, so for my younger family or younger kids, you know, I talk to the parents about you always make X, Y, and Z for breakfast. Okay. What green, like you look at the pot or the plate, what green can you add to it? And what purple can you add to it? You know, just getting them to sort of, Oh, you know, I'm in the morning. Oh yeah. Dr. George says I'm looking at this plate, what am I going to add to it? You know? Um, so that <laughs> talking to them about those things and the value of that, you know, yeah, I, I like your concept of plant, that plant dense foods. It's a nice concept because, <laughs> you know, we have so many, we have so much jargon, but that really talks about very practically what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a remarkable concept. I want to talk about, um, uh, maybe the frustration of the fact that, you know, when most docs, if you're dealing with patients, you're dealing one on one with the patient and, you know, you're engaging them intellectually and so on. You're in the position of having to deal with the caregivers of your patients. And so because you're dealing with parents that are taking care of their children. So those parents have all of their own preconceived notions about all of these things. And as you make the point, Probably in a lot of cases, they're feeling like these are young kids. They can do whatever. It's not going to impact them. What do we really care? Let's just do. So talk about that frustration of having to go almost third party to deal with the kinds of things you want to see changed in your patient population. The frustration is real. <laughs> I mean, it is real because I. The me parents are sort of like, you know, throwing their hands up in the air sometimes where they're like, ah, I know it's not great for us, but we, we love it. You know, it makes us happy. We're going to have ice cream every night after dinner. There's nothing you can say that's going to change my mind. <laughs> I'm like, all right, all right, let's talk about breakfast. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, they, they don't necessarily, I would say a lot of them don't necessarily want to change their behavior and therefore, you know. Right. Um, but it's not going to be. Yeah, because the parents themselves are locked in to the consciousness of what they're doing. So in a way, you've got to really completely educate and alter the consciousness of the parents to be able to have them now feel like it's valuable for their children. And that's yeah, that's, that's a tough true. act. That's a tough act in some <laughs> cases. I get that. I'll tell you, though, the other side of that that's very cool, though, is I remember when I was raising my kids and I knew a lot of families, they would have killed to have a pediatrician that was sensitive to the fact that they were trying to do vegan and plant-based food in their homes. Mm -hmm. So are you finding that you are attracting more of those kinds of families when they get the word out that, hey, Dr. George is pretty cool. She's mm -hmm. into really supporting this idea of a plant-based lifestyle and so on. So are you finding more and more of that coming your way? Yes. I mean, that's always been something when they kind of read up about me or look me up, they're always, you know, there's always that sort of percentage of patients that are like, oh, we're so excited. We picked you because you seem like you are interested in nutrition and not just like handing out an antibiotic for everything. And, you know, so yeah, there's definitely that following, um, you know, especially when I was in Texas, I, you know, sort of had about 40 so families that were plant-based, plant-curious, vegan that, you know, were under my umbrella because, you know, of practice, because they were, you know, very, of you know, of that mindset. So I definitely do attract those who are sort of nutritionally conscious, even if they're not necessarily vegan, they um, seek out that type of guidance, you know, because they feel comfortable with it. I think they, they well, want to know that. Yeah, with that in mind, let's tell people where you are. So if they want to find you, they can learn, read more about you and look you up and, and kind of come to you. So wh what's the URL you want them to go to? Sure. Yeah, my personal website is Roxanne George MD. So my first and last name, R-O-X-A-N-N-E, George, G-E-O-R-G-E-M-D.com. Perfect. So Roxanne, Roxanne George MD, um, dot com, And, you know, you can always message me there. I, you know, comes right to my email. I can reach out to you there. Um, my practice is in North Jersey, um, Advocare, Sussex County Pediatrics. Um, there's more information about me on that. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out or come visit and say hi. <laughs> Be more than happy to talk. So <laughs> so, so Advocare is a, is a brick and mortar practice. I mean, it's not it's not an online practice. So how mm -hmm. much how talk, talk to me about Advocare because you moved into that. Tell sure. me how that operates and then tell me how you integrate that. And do you do any online stuff at the same time? 
Um, so right now I just moved uh, to New Jersey. So, you know, joining a group practice, AdvoCare is a bigger umbrella practice. So they have locations everywhere. Again, we're in Sussex County and Newton. And um, so that's my normal everyday practice where, you know, even if you're not necessarily plant-based, we still talk about nutrition because that's just part of every, you know, pediatric well care visit. And I integrate it into my sick visits as well. Um, and so that's where I practice, pra you know, do my hands-on practice. And then online, you know, people will find me and reach out to me with questions or to do interviews or to do talks at events, you know. Um, but online hasn't really, you know, picked up necessarily as far as uh, televisits or anything like that. I don't, you know, do a lot of that because honestly, most of my time is in the office. <laughs> well, you're seeing kids and all. Yeah. So, uh, so is your, is your, is AdvoCare uh, just you or is there a group? Is it a group no, of pediatricians? Yeah. And so in that group, are you like-minded people or you have people that completely are not into what you're doing and they're doing it their way or how does it work? Oh, no, I wouldn't join a practice like that. <laughs> My uh, colleagues are not necessarily, um, you know, vegan or 100 plus. Right. Base, but they are definitely like sort of nutrition minded and are like, yes, I agree. We should get people more on plants, you know. Um, so definitely on board with that kind of messaging. So, yes. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. You know, one of the big things for me, because I, I just did a whole book on, you know, obesity and lifestyle and so on, is that this incredible pandemic of childhood obesity, which we know is a remarkable, devastating development. How do you as a pediatrician see how you could make a bigger dent in that process? Meaning that it's obvious that things have to change in school lunch programs, things have to change in the home. So many things have to change and move away from the kinds of eating habits that people have. Is there any way that you are able to, with your gravitas, with your ability, with your you know, um, experience and expertise, are you able to get into school systems? Do you lecture in school systems? Do you go into that kind of an environment? Talk a little bit about how you see you taking you know, care of or moving in the direction of caring for that problem. It's funny you mentioned that actually, because moving to New Jersey, I have you know, taken on the initiative um, of meeting with the schools and the school nurses in our area. Um, I call it my <laughs> the school project. And so really to let, you know, the schools and the school nurses know that we're out, you know, we're here in the community and we want to become a, like a resource and an asset to however they need us, you know, however we can be useful. Um, I agree. I think a, it, part of being a pediatrician is, you know, kind of taking on these, you know, little projects. And so, you know, in Texas, of course, my plant-based messaging and I was giving talks, but also, you know, we took on like swimming and safety and water safety. And so coming up to New Jersey, I wanted to kind of get more involved in the schools and um, my, you know, practice was totally okay with that. Um, so I am, after meeting with a good number of the schools and the school nurses, you know, we've talked about bringing on these projects of, you know, healthy eating and body image, men, you know, mental health issues and how to talk about different topics like that, sleep habits and healthy, you know, um, exercise and all of that. So it, it, it's, um, sort of a labor of love. It's something I do in addition to my hours, um, of work. Um, and hopefully, you know, I might join one of the schools and, you know, one of their bigger projects as far as like a health, health fairs and things like that. So you, got, so you got your you got your tentacles into the community just a little bit too, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tentacles, but yeah, my interest, they're very well aware that I have a particular interest in helping them, you know, sort of help communicate this messaging of healthy lifestyle. So you know, the other thing that um is interesting to me and on some levels very appalling, and that is that you know, with the pressures that we see now with the internet and the and the rapid processing of information we see so much more mental health issues in the younger population. So you're seeing depressions, anxieties, attention deficits, a lot of these kind of really neurologically based issues showing up younger and younger. And I find it appalling in this really rampant use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs given to infants and children. Can you speak to that a little bit and what your feeling is about that, that, that movement of this whole field of psychiatry and psychological intervention 
-hmm. going younger and younger with these benzodiazepines and SSRIs and these drugs that have remarkably devastating consequences when they're put into the nervous systems and brains of people younger and younger. Can you address that a little bit? Sure. Um, I am not one who prescribes um, I antidepressants or benzos for my patients. Um, I, you know, they have to go through me first and kind of, you know, check my boxes that they've done right. this and done this and done this. And um, certainly nobody's giving them to infants, but yeah, the younger children, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's becoming more prevalent across the board and it's making it more difficult for the children to, to escape it, I would say, um, you know, because sort of the parents are, you know, attention spans have sort of shrunk. I think it's down to like generously, I think around 50 seconds, um, you know, it's and the children of course are getting impacted by, like you said, social media and everything being sort of click, click, click. And um, it's, <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I, they have, if they're my patient, they're going through sort of a checklist of things they have to try first. Um, I always um, sort of cite the study where exercise was, um, was as seen as better than Wellbutrin as far as treatment um, for depression. And so I make sure I'm like, you're getting sunlight. Like, this is like, I write it down. And it's like, this is your prescription. Like, you have to do this. <laughs> you have to get out in the sunlight. You have to do 30 to 60 minutes of exercise. And sometimes they're like, they shut down as soon as you say like, you right. know, 30 minutes of exercise. So I'm like, look, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes tomorrow. It can be, you put your sneakers on this week, you know, and then next week you, you know, go outside, you open the door, you step out on the patio and then you breathe in six times and then you go back in the next week, you're going to do a little bit more. So it's sort of that, you know, very tiny bit. And if you can commit to that, but if I can't get you to commit to that, then, you know, you're not really, really. So you tired. work, you work in tiny increments and try to keep moving forward with the whole yeah. process. Yeah, I was saying, in, in regard to that, I mean, when we talk about life style medicine, I know this is of interest to you and you're moving in the direction of doing more and more of that and so on. Sure. The pillars of that include, as you mentioned, exercise. They, they include stress and stress management. They include these features. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with a young population like that, and I did this with my children because very early in their lives, we did stuff with meditation, yoga, things of that nature. Are you someone who tries to incorporate that mentality younger and younger in the lives of these people oh, as nice sure. as real cognitive resources that they can use to deal with these growing stresses that are occurring with anxieties, depressions? And so how do you how does how is that being accepted in your practice by parents? And, and is that something that you're doing? I would say it's like you know, I kind of approach it more, you know, as breathing exercises and right. quiet time. Um, I think sometimes, you know, depending, you, you get to know your patients and you know who, who you can, you know, use those like strong, like feel like they're strong words, you know, if you say meditation, they're like, oh, okay, you right. know, woo woo doctor, you know, um, but breathing exercises and, you know, sort of grounding yourself and getting that time outside, you know, um, I would say they're pretty open to that type of, you know, and describing it in that way, they're pretty open to it. Yeah. Um, in general, I think that they're more open to that than diet. Well, you're, get, you're getting them, you're getting them away from the constant screen time, which is yeah. just a devastation. So the truth is, well, you have to be very specific about that, because they'll go outside and walk like this. With yeah, their phone. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Talking about uh, music, and I see that beautiful upright in the background. And I noticed on your bio that you were studying the violin. So talk about the importance of music in your life. In fact, I find that it's incredibly important for children. I, you know, I'm, I was so, I gravitated to music so much in my life that I wanted my sons to find it and I introduced them early. And so now they're kind of professional musicians. That's what they do. But talk a little bit about your interest in music. Cause so many doctors I know, you know, go into music. Music is a tremendous outlet for all kinds of doctors and scientists that I know. So talk about the importance of that to you. Oh, yeah. Music is so important um, for me personally. I've always been involved in music. It's always been in our family, just, you know, in church choirs and, you know, playing the piano and playing, you know, my interests. You know, I'm trying to teach myself the violin. Um, and, 
you know, in singing, I've always, you know, done a lot of singing. And I, I think music is a wonderful outlet because, you know, one, it uses kind of a different part of your brain and learning a new instrument or learning a new language helps keep your brain developing more neurons and, you know, keeps you healthy and sharp in other areas. Um, and it's, it is a great outlet. Um, you know, I'm sure you've been in the car and your favorite song comes on and all of a sudden you're just like, you know, singing along in a great mood, you know, it's, it really works almost like you know, those endorphins, right? Kind of come out and makes you happy. And, you know, I think being in medicine, we've always sort of been exposed to, you know, in our training, you know, our attendings or some more senior doctors, you know, maybe playing music in the background while they do a procedure or surgery. And, you know, it just helps them get in the zone and focus them. And so it's- Well, you know, you got all that left brain activity. So that right brain music stuff is really kind of brings a little balance to that picture. Right. Just <laughs> I think that's what physicians it is. Are so, and, you know, when you're doing your doctor work, you're so left brain in a way because it's mm -hmm. operating at that level. So yeah, so there's a, a good outlet for that. So let me ask you a question in terms mm -hmm. of what the work you're doing now, Mm -hmm. Is there some direction that you see yourself moving toward in the future? Are there things you want to get done uh, in, in your own professional life down the road? Talk a little bit about that. What's Where are you going with everything you're doing? Yeah, um, like I mentioned before, working with the schools, um, kind of getting more involved in the communities. Um, as you mentioned before, um, meditation, um, I know there's a lot of um, studies with transcendental meditation in school, especially inner city schools. Where I am is North Jersey. It's not inner city. It's a little bit, you know, more suburban, maybe on the edge of rural, but it's, um, you know, I, I see so much value in it. It just with children with, you know, sort of chaotic home lives, you know, um, right. and I think integrating that into even more school systems and, you know, sort of focusing even on the suburban areas um, of like, you know, helping with meditation and the school lunches and, you know, understanding the mental health impacts of, you know, social media and how bad all that can be um, is important. So it's, you know, I like to get involved more in the community, um, for sure, with the school projects and that, um, as well as, you know, continuing to work on my book with, you know, sort of keep tailoring it to different topics and, you know, <laughs> being, you know, was originally more sort of totally focused on pediatric nutri nutrition, but now I'm sort of, you know, zooming out a little bit more into wellness in general, um, right. maybe more the lifestyle aspect of it in general, just because of how much in the last couple of years, mental health in pediatrics has, you know, increased or as far as the problems have increased. So it's uh, really important. Uh, that's pretty much where I'm headed, you know, more on the short term. <laughs> that's good. As we wind this down, are there any final words you'd like to share with the audience out here? Um, you know, thank you for listening and thank you for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, you know, with any questions or anything you need more clarification on. Um, I hope, you know, if there's one messaging that lands um, for somebody who's, you know, curious about, you know, lifestyle medicine or plant-based diets, it's, you know, take it, baby steps are okay. You know, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress kind of idea. Um, it's important to, you know, look back and say six months ago, you know, I was in this spot and now, you know, I've made progress from there. And as long as you keep making that progress, you know, you're going to be more motivated to do more and make bigger steps. So just focus on like, the two feet in front of you and you know don't worry that you messed up yesterday just today is a new day keep moving forward um and think about what you can add to your plate versus you know what are you giving up or sacrificing um you know it's a mindset of abundance this lifestyle movement uh this plant-based and lifestyle movement you know it's because we have so many options and we get to have all these fruits and vegetables at our disposal so it should never be a mindset of Ugh, I can't have this. Woe is me. It's like I get to make these healthy choices because I happen to live, you know, in the part of the world where I get, you know, multiple grocery stores, <laughs> which is, you know, most of our most of our population. Well, I can't thank my guest, Dr. Roxanne George, <laughs> enough for joining us today, sharing her information, her knowledge. And, and if you want to reach out to her and get her help, 
and get some insight about what she's doing. Uh, her, her website is scrolling across the screen, RoxanneGeorgeMD.com. I urge you to follow her and to learn more about how she's working with children and families because it's such an important place. That's where it all has to start with the children, as we all know that. And I really want to thank uh, those of you that have joined us today because we can't do what we do without you. And I want to thank you for being part of this really active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you, Dr. George. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.